everyone. I'm Nicole from Wild for Change, and welcome to AAA Radio. Today, we will be discussing the magnificent rhino with our guest, Simon Jones, CEO of Helping Rhinos. Helping Rhinos is predominantly based in Africa. Their focus is on helping the species survive at sustainable levels by improving protection, care, and welfare of the rhino in its natural habitat, as well as to forge significant partnerships with successful organizations. Helping Rhinos is celebrating 10 years of protecting rhinos. Its start began in March of 2012, when Simon learned of the shocking poaching of three rhinos at the Karaka Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. It had been just two years prior that Simon had spent six weeks on a conservation project at the Karaka Game Reserve and became acquainted with a rhino named Tandy. Tandy was one of those three rhinos who fortunately survived the poaching incident. After enduring many operations, she has given birth to four calves in the past 10 years. A remarkable story that speaks volumes of helping rhinos' dedication to ensure the future of the magnificent rhino. Hi, Simon. A warm welcome, and thank you for being here today. Hi, Nicole. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here, and um, thank you for, for inviting me on. Oh, I've been wanting to speak with you for some time. Um, I've always admired your work at Helping Rhinos and with your partnerships. So let's get started. My first question that I would like to ask is about Helping Rhinos' number one objective, which is funding to help conserve and protect the rhinos. Um, In the last 10 years, Helping Rhinos has raised 2.25 million pounds for rhino conservation, and that is an amazing feat. I read, yeah, it's amazing. I read that Helping Rhinos' focus is creating sustainable funding models. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, sure. So, um, So as you say, Nicole, I guess one one of the things I'm most proud about, you know, having started the organization on the back of the Tandy poaching, as you as you already mentioned, you know, a decade ago, um, is getting us to a position where we've been able to raise the amount of money that we have um, over that period of time. And also taking it, helping rhinos to, you know, what started up as a very small organization here in the UK to now, you know, having our headquarters here, we have registered offices in the US and in the Netherlands. Um, so, so I guess you know I'm incredibly proud of that, and and the, and as you also mentioned in your introduction, we work. You know, our projects are predominantly across Africa, um, across South Africa, which is actually home to 72% of the world's rhino and about 80% of Africa's rhino, um, and we also have projects in in Kenya as well. And um, so, but but as an international NGO, our our main objective is to generate funds to allow our projects and our and our project partners to be able to do the work that they do so i'm very much a believer in having different people play to their strengths um and um and 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 if you like rather than everybody trying to do everything working in their own little silos is say like you know the guys on our project teams on the ground are good at patrolling fences or raising rhino orphans, you know, so let them do that as much as I would love to be out doing that the whole time. You know, I'm, I was born in the UK, brought up in the UK. And so, you know, our strength that we can do with our team here is more on the fundraising side of things and raising, raising the funds, which isn't typically what everyone who's so busy on the, on the ground can do. So, so that I think is, is, that's the key role of helping rhinos and and as to what sustainable funding models looks like that's really what we we are trying to focus on so you know the charitable sector the the not-for-profit sector is you know is is can work very much in a sort of uh, you know month to month year to year perspective you know we're trying to build now what we're calling, and we, I'm sure we'll come and touch on this, what, what we're calling rhino strongholds. So, you know, a sustainable wild spaces that can support, you know, populations of rhinos and other wildlife. Um, but, but to create these spaces that is protected in perpetuity takes, you know, a lot of income and, and, and not just, okay, we're going to do this this year and then we'll worry about next year, next year. We're looking at 10 year, 20 year programs. So we need to build sustainable models. So we have a confidence 
of money coming in each year so we can say okay we're going to take this and we know it's going to be a five-year program but we're confident we can afford that because we we know we've through our sustainable income streams uh we've got funds coming in to to, to be able to achieve that wow that's incredible i like the um <clears throat> the perspective of the long-term sustainability for rhino survival yeah i think we have to look at look at that um you know and you know, and for for me, it's 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 kind of something that's a, a little subtle change in the direction. You know, I think we have been quite reactive, and necessarily so over the last decade or ten to fifteen years, because we've been in the middle of an awful poaching crisis. You know, we were losing over three rhinos a day at its height in. 2014 2015 um you know we had to be reactive we had to think about what do we need to get more boots on the ground more dogs on patrol more eyes in the sky patrols you know that's still really important but now we must be looking you know at how do we protect habitat and how do we work with local local people and local communities you know again that's yeah. key for me that's key to the fundamental long-term success of conservation projects is how do we w engage the the people who live around those areas we're trying to protect for wildlife and and have them living alongside and being a part of conservation projects and that takes that takes funding and we need to be able to know we can do that sustainably year on year rather than set something up and then we can't afford to maintain it in years two three four and five so um so yeah so i think that 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 for me is is what we need to do and if you think about what we do in the if we were a normal business and not a not-for-profit business, for example, you would be thinking, what does my five-year strategy look like? And am I sustainable? And have I got business plans? And I always say we need to run, well, certainly helping rhinos, you know, but I think every every organization should run the same. You know, we will run our not-for-profit organization as if it was a for-profit business, but our, our shareholders are, are munching grass on the plains in Africa rather than sitting in a boardroom. And if we have that mindset, then we'll be sustainable and we can deliver the results we really need to for our wildlife and for the environment. I like that outlook because it makes sense to yeah. have that, um, like you said, a, a long-term plan it, it, as if you were uh, not for, uh, for profit as a business looking at what your sustainability will be like 10 years down the road. Yeah. That's brilliant. I think you have to have that model or, or you know, and that, unfortunately that's why we see a lot of not-for-profits, you know, you know, there, there is a, you know, a lot of not-for-profits that, that don't survive the journey, shall we say, um, you know, and, and that's understandable because of the environment that, that people operate in and the nature of relying on, you know, people's generosity at, at donating. Um, and, and we rely on that, of course, a huge amount um but, but how can we how can we find the right models that, that that means we can rely on that now and tomorrow and and in the future yeah amazing I, I, i'm very impressed by that and a lot of it too as you were saying is is partnerships successful partnerships and collaboration with local communities which is also very key yeah. to this to their yeah. future for the rhino's future it, it really is. Um, you know, I could give you a, a very real example. I was in South Africa in, in February this year. Um, we actually, it was part of our 10th anniversary celebrations. We had a, a little film crew out with us um, making some films. And one of that was, you know, we just actually through the generosity of a, of a donor in the US actually had, had built um, a preschool um, on the borders of one of our protected wild spaces. Um, and it was in an area that was quite remote. So a lot of the children wouldn't have had any sort of early education at all um, until this school was built. And, and if we hadn't built the school, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have had any sort of education at all even now. So or early education now. You know, and I was asked a question by more than one person. Well, why are you building a school? What's that got to do with protecting rhinos? You know, and I, I would love them to sort of have been at this opening. So we had to one of the Zulu Kings, some of the community chiefs coming along, um, you know, and the bit that struck to, to me, they, you know, there were some speeches and, you know, the King said, what we, what's important now is that we, they recognize that this school has been built and how it's been built through conservation land being there, you know, and actually said, you know, anybody caught 
cutting fences or starting fires or, or poaching rhinos will be held accountable to the king. Um, and you think, well, there, you know, and that's the importance of working with the local communities, you know, and, you know, I hear lots of people saying, oh, but we provide lots of jobs, you know, but actually giving the local people jobs of, you know, cleaning the toilets and changing the beds is is not engaging them in conservation. We have to bring them in at a level, at, a, at an overall community level. How does the community benefit financially from conservation being there? How do they feel a part of it? Um, and that's those models. We, we've got a lot more work to do in terms of what they look like. But there's a, you know, there's there's good examples like the building of the, the preschool. And, you know, and I'm pleased to say we actually have some funding for two or three more preschools we're working wow. on at the moment as well. So, um, Incredible. so yeah, so so our, I mentioned our rhino strongholds. And, and sorry, Nicole, I'm probably going off on, no, on go the tangents now, but, uh, but you know, we have three strategic pillars to our rhino strongholds. So one is protecting the wildlife, and that's everything we've been doing. It's boots on the ground, it's it's anti-poaching dogs, um, our eyes in the sky program, um, you know, looking at technology and cameras. We have sustaining habitats. So um, so how do we how do we ensure that we are creating more wild spaces you know um a lot of wild spaces um for anyone listening that's you know been out to particularly like in south africa will know there's lots of individual reserves they have fences around them so how can we try and drop some of those fences and, and create more natural behavior of animals migrating you know naturally from one area to another and then we have inspiring people and that's inspiring people in the local communities like the preschool but also you know, doing things like this that's in, hopefully inspiring people all around the world to want to get more involved in in wine, rhino conservation and, and wildlife conservation generally. Yeah, I think you have it all well laid out. <clears throat> and <clears throat> what seems what sounds so important <clears throat> is for people to understand is that people want to feel like they're a part of community. They want to feel like they're a part of something. Getting locals involved under helping people understand that um, these rhinos need these wild spaces, breaking down those fences, having corridors, um, more habitat, more resources for them. Like it seems like from my perspective, as I'm listening to you, that helping rhinos has this well thought out plan of how to actually approach this from every angle possible to ensure their survival. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm glad that comes across because we kind of do spend quite a lot of time looking at that that overview, if you like, and you know, um, aeroplane view, if you like, in terms of of what does conservation mean, you know, and yeah. and, and and you know, and it does require lots of different groups and entities to to work together um, and not against each other, right. Um, I think um, you need that higher perspective, like you said, in order to see the bigger picture and to ensure that success down the road. Yeah, it, it's it is it, it's quite a complex because right, we actually have to have that, you know, as, I, as I've you know just been talking about. But but we also can't lose sight of the fact that we also have to put fuel in vehicles. Um, we have to put you know batteries into camera traps and, and solar panels up to you know when in South Africa some of your 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 listeners might be aware they have something called load shedding you know where it's just protect power so the power gets switched off now if you're running security fences and security cameras that typically run on power then you need to have some sort of backup and generators and such like so we need to think of that very high you know helicopter look view but we also need to get right down into the detail and think about okay what do we need to do now as well on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that we are protecting um, protecting the rhinos in the spaces that, that they're at. Right, right. So true. Yes, I, I understand that. That it that it that's a lot to think about. <clears throat> yeah, it is a lot to think about. Hopefully, we're doing the thinking, and we can can, <laughs> can pull people in with us. <laughs> right, right. Can you speak about some of your partnerships? I know you have very special partnerships with. Um, conservancies to help ensure the rhinos uh, successful long-term survival can you speak about like the eyes in the skies program or yeah. the black mambas sure um yeah I, I i'll pick just a few I, I could talk for hours as you could imagine <laughs> around our projects but uh yeah um 
but but yeah so we have quite a i'd like to think a, a, a relatively diverse um uh suite of of projects on the ground and and we do, as i mentioned earlier we kind of are working with with our partners on the ground because i think that's the right approach um you know so you mentioned the eyes in the sky that's um something we're particularly proud of in eastern cape in south africa so um working alongside our partner the african um rhino conservation collaboration which is run by dr will folds who's quite a famous vet um treated in fact treated tandy when he was the lead vet treating tandy when she oh, was wow. those years afterwards um so so but, but you know having we we know it's been proven that having an aerial presence can be a big deterrent to poachers in in the area so so we actually now have a plane that's been funded um the pilot is an incredible story um he's a guy called Siseko Mayenji he's from the local community um I could actually share with you a, a link to a, to a video we made that tells you his backstory how he got to be a pilot but he ended up being training as a pilot um and now he is flying the plane across the, a number of reserves in the eastern cape as that as that visual deterrent and that now is moving even beyond the plane into drones and you know he's becoming a qualified or is a qualified drone pilot now because that's a cheaper way of getting eyes in the sky so right um so so th that's one project the black members you mentioned they're up in the, the greater kruger area um so they're the the world's first all-female anti-poaching unit um and they're an incredible bunch of uh of ladies all from the local communities all incredibly passionate about wildlife conservation um and they are out you know patrolling fences 20 kilometers a day uh, wow. uh you know just looking for signs of insurgents um of poachers coming in and signs of wildlife breaking out as well because if they break out of that border fence um, then that's you know not going to be end well for them either so um so incredibly you know but and and their role has has changed a lot over the, the years you know at one point you know we, you know they were in ambushes you know because the intelligence told us there was a poaching incident coming in you know as as poaching has is still a big threat but but there's not quite the the, the level of insurgents and ambushes that there were because we've been a decade of Bringing new technology and, and new processes in place um but but yeah so they a lot of their work is in the community as well they run what we call the bush babies program which is the the education outreach program and we have 11 local schools where a, a bunch of um learners will um will will go into the schools teach them conservation we paint up the schools we put fans on the and the classrooms fans up in the classrooms to make it a more pleasurable learning experience oh, yeah, and then oh, the higher yeah. performers we bring into reserve because they, they live on the border of kruger national parks many have never seen an elephant or a rhino or a lion or, or anything else you know so it's amazing to me so we bring them in so we do that we and so there's just a couple of examples we have obviously have Kareka foundation we mentioned where tandy was that's where she was poach so we're working with them again a lot of work in in the communities and the schools and anti-poaching patrols um uh one always favorite um south african project of ours is is the, is our orphanage with the zulu land rhino orphanage um so and we now have six rhino orphans in there um and i think that's you know we actually only had because we've released a number back into the wild which is obviously our aim we rescue them we, we we raise them up when they're big enough strong enough we return them back into the wild obviously having done a lot of work on where's the safest place to, to release them um you know we were had one orphan leco for quite some time um you know we were looking at we've got this orphanage facility you know and and just one orphan in it but you know it's it's the only dedicated rhino orphanage facility in the region um, you know, now we're sitting here four months later with six rhinos in because mm. poaching is really off. During COVID, it was very difficult to move around. International borders were closed. Poaching definitely plummeted in that time. And now in, the, in this year, we've seen a um, a real spike. So yeah. our orphanage is in, is in KwaZulu-Natal. And to give you an idea, they had 33 rhinos lost in the first six months of last year and 133 this year. Oh um in the first six months and we and we see that evidenced in the number of orphans coming in so we've gone from you know okay do we need all this facility now to now we are about to go out and ask for funding for to to expand the facility further because christmas is traditionally a bad time for poaching um poachers know that a lot of 
a lot of staff, you know, would like to be with their families as as everybody does over yeah. the holidays. And um, so how do we, you know, how so, so it's traditionally a, a, a bad time for poaching. So we need to be a, on our guard and be ready for more orphans to come in. Um, that's unfortunate. That, that, that's a, yeah, it's, unfortunately, it is, the, you know, it is the case. And um, so our South African projects and then in Kenya, we have a, we work very closely with the, um, our Pejeta Conservancy, which is, most famous, I guess, for being home to the last northern white rhino in the world. Um, so there's two females only left, um, Nain and Fatu, and it was a mother and daughter. Um, the last male, Sudan, died in March 2018. Yes. Um, so, um, so that's what they're, they're most famous for. But and and we work with them very closely. There's a scientific program using IVF, and how can yeah, we? Yeah, I actually, wanted to ask about that. Yeah. So that's um. So that I mean that's really science. You know, using science to to try and protect the species. And if we can make it work in the northern whites, then we can use it in other species such as Sumatran rhinos and and you know other species of wildlife altogether. Um, but the idea is trying to use science to create embryos, so harvesting eggs to all intents and purposes from the existing females, um, using frozen sperm from sperm banks that's been frozen, if you like, um, from northern white rhino males, and trying to create embryos. And if we can create, we've been successful in creating a number of embryos, and if we succeed, and then the next step is to try and insert an embryo into a, a southern white surrogate mother so you now have surrogate southern white rhinos which is the most numerous subspecies right. of all rhinos, um giving birth to hopefully purebred northern whites but you can imagine with such limited amounts of you, you know of embryos available we need to try and prove the whole thing works before we start using the northern white embryos uh, okay uh, so we're quite a you know we're all, we've come a long way but we've still got a long way to go right uh, that program I mean, it's very exciting i mean very i try not exciting. to use the the words jurassic park but you know and and in fact the scientists <laughs> really don't like it if you if you say that um because it's it, you know it's kind of glorifying it but if you're trying to make it every understandable to the everyday layperson it is kind of taking something you know the northern white is functionally extinct so there are two females who who cannot breed naturally and ca they cannot even carry a calf even if you could do artificial okay. insemination for example you know their 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 hips are not in a good way they wouldn't be able to carry a calf so i was going to uh, ask about that if they were yeah, able so, to so they can't so so you know so we we have to if the species is to have any hope of any sort of future we have to get very creative using science and you know brains far more powerful than mine in terms of um, how we go about doing that uh, um, that that scientific approach and using laboratories to to hopefully you know prove that we can you know we can bring a species back from from extinction because it's worth remembering that the northern white is in central you know it, it comes from central africa you know the likes of sudan democratic republic of congo um, South Sudan, uh, and you know they're only in the state they're in. There's, you know, there, there is there's all sorts of talk of you know are there any, the odd one or two still surviving in the wild? They haven't been seen for a decade or more. Um, if they are, um, and if they are, if there are any left, and I'm personally I'm not sure there are, then um, you know then then there's only not huge numbers <laughs> to, right. to, to carry the population going forward. But um, if you can't, if we're not really sure if they're even in existence, then there's not enough. Population there's not enough. To... Exactly, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, and, and so they're <laughs> in this situation because they've been poached, you know, it's very difficult to run conservation projects in areas that typically have been, you know, riddled with civil wars, um, you know, and they said so they've been poached to this level. So this is the reason I feel that, that we have an obligation. People often say to me, but species go extinct all the time. It's just a natural cycle. And I think if it is a natural cycle, you should let nature take its course. But, you know, the Northern Whites are in a position now because of our actions and our actions alone, not because of any natural cycle. And therefore, I think we have an obligation to try and do something to turn that around. Yes, I agree. I, <clears throat> this This extinction process that you know, many scientists are saying we're experiencing currently is due to it's our human hands have been in the mix because of it. Yeah. And um, like you said, these animals and the flora that's going extinct is, is 
all because of us. And we have a responsibility to take care of the planet and yeah. all of its creatures that are here, that if we can still help maintain some sort of security for their future, why shouldn't we? Yeah, you're yeah, absolutely right. You know, and, and even for our own good, you know, we, we hear about exactly. climate change, environmental issues, you know, these for me, these are all absolutely valid. And, you know, we see it. We, You know, when I first visited Eastern Cape, uh, when some, what, 12 years ago now, it, everywhere was so green. You know, it, it, it was actually renowned for being quite a wet area. And I, I remember one of my first ever visits there, I took a photo of a rhino and it was all so green around. And someone said to me, it looks great, but it could be in the UK because it's so green. It doesn't didn't look like Africa or the perception of Africa, you know? Yeah. You go to Easter Cape now and in the middle of a five-year drought, um, you know, everywhere is brown. It, five it, years. You know, yeah. I mean, let's not say they've had no rain, for, they, but they've had nowhere near enough rain, so... Um, you know, so so climate change is having an impact on, you know, uh, definitely on on our planet, obviously, but but and on our wildlife and, and therefore on us, you know, which, you know, coming back to our rhino strongholds is, you know, yes, we're trying to create areas of protected natural beauty for rhinos and other wildlife to live in. But if we can do that and we can, you know, have these wild spaces protected, then that will help ultimately um, with some of the environmental issues we're experiencing. So, you know, we have to we have to try and you know, to say looking after and protecting rhinos is is ultimately also protecting us wherever we are in the world. Exactly. Yep. So um yeah Thanks. we have to we have to keep sorry, we have to keep protecting these wild spaces and, and not concreting them over and such likes. I agree. I agree a hundred percent. And and it's funny that you're speaking about this because <clears throat> Like you said, it's not just, we're not just trying to save their habitats. We're also just trying to help the planet and us as well. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm going off track a little bit, but I did wanted to ask you about the importance of the rhino because the rhino is a keystone species and they are pertinent to the ecosystem in which they live. And by saving them, we're helping to save the ecosystem, <clears throat> saving the planet at large. Could you um, just give maybe a little bit of background to listeners about why rhinos are so important, so paramount to ecosystems? Yeah, so they 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 are you know as a, as a sort of a mega herbivore, um, as you say, an umbrella species. So you know they actually they actually. Um, well, if you like the sort of the, the farmers of, of of nature, if you like, you think they the type of things they eat, um, lots of seeds, and then through their dung they'll disperse seeds. So they're creating um, a, a natural environment um, that that is um, ecologically strong and sound and and biologically diverse i um, mean i always use the example of you know you see piles of rung and, and actually rhinos have what we call middens so they tend to always leave their dung in the same place so when you're driving around if if, if people have been on safari they will have often i'm sure seen if they've been anywhere where rhinos are they you, know, you will have seen these big piles of dung because they will typically always poo in the same place it's part of their territory marking yeah. You know, and then you find the dung beetles that come in and they create you know, these dung balls through there, you know, and the same could be said, you know, the elephant elephant dung as well. So, you know, the same argument could be said for elephants as I'm making for rhinos. Right. Um, uh, and, you know, so and so they're creating, you know, and, and the, the, they're naturally sort of maintaining it. As I said, there's sort of the wildlife gardeners, if you like, because they're maintaining this habitat. They're eating trees. We've all seen elephants destroy trees. You know, I was, saw one the other day, a big tree, and this elephant just pushed it down because it wanted the moisture from the roots, you know. Um, but then it will eat that, and then that seeds will be do, will do be dispersed, and it will, you know, will go elsewhere. So, um, so... And then we know by having, you know, having that, that that takes carbon, you know, carbon out of the atmosphere, you know, the, the more sort of natural wild spaces we have, you know, the better that is for our overall, for the overall environment. Um, and, and then we know that that is better for us. So, you know, we, we know what we can see what's happening. We're seeing more, as I just gave you an example of, you know, more droughts happening. Um, we see more extreme weather conditions, I guess, is what I'm saying is, you know, we, we've we've had floods, you know, even in the Kruger area, you know, it can be, you know, one one time of the year it's, you know, extremely dry and then you get downpours. In fact, I was in Kruger 
just a few weeks ago. Um, I drove for two hours with rain that you couldn't see through and the thunderstorm wow. right above, you know. And then what happens is then that the, because everywhere is so dry, it can't absorb the water quick enough with, with the, how hard the rain is coming down. So then you get flash flooding and, you know, and then you get landslides. And, you know, we see in Australia with the fires and such likes. And so we are seeing a lot more extreme weather conditions occurring around the globe and and that is you know so we have to try and think overcome that and we have to understand what's driving that and, and how do we try and reverse that you know we hear a lot about you know keeping global temperature rises you know below one and a half degrees um which is important you know we do that i believe by protecting more wild spaces you know stop concreting over let's right. leave, leave big trees that we know um you know, sequestration of carbon out of the, the atmosphere is huge for that. And I think we have to look at protecting wild spaces isn't just protecting wild spaces for rhinos and elephants and, and wildlife, uh, whatever wildlife it is in the area you're looking. It's actually protecting wild spaces that is going to help the health of the planet. And that's what you know, ultimately our own species survival will depend on that. Yeah. And that's what I think is so wonderful about helping rhinos is that <clears throat> you're having the foresight to understand that um, saving the rhino and saving these wild spaces is actually doing something better for the planet, um, helping to maintain its its health at wherever it's at right now um, for all of us. And I think for, you know, many people maybe don't understand why that's so paramount to not just for the animals, but for humans as well, for <laughs> ensuring our own future. And yeah. um, you recently had, a, you hosted and sponsored the Global Gala for um, rhinos. And I believe you had mentioned a new project that you are undergoing with actually helping to expand the habitat for rhinos, but also for watering holes. Is that correct? Um, yeah, so that's some of um, so that's the global gala for rhinos we had was held in London, but streamed streamed globally, um, and that was with our Kenyan partner, Old Pegeta. Um, so yes, it was very much looking. You know, we were trying to raise funds for our Rhino Strongholds initiatives, which was um, which um, Old Pegeta and the wider Laikipi areas is, is is part of that. Um, part of that process that we're trying to do with Rhino Strongholds in one of our locations. Um, and again, there's all sorts of elements to that. You know, there is how do we, you know, how do we protect water sources? You know, we're seeing that becoming, as I said, you know, in, with droughts, you know, uh, Kenya and that part of Kenya particularly, again, is experiencing, you know, um, an unheard of drought drought in our sort of generation. Um, yeah, I think they lost 200 overall. elephants this year. Yeah, there's a exactly that. There's, there's, you know, there, it's a real problem, you know, with and walk, protecting water sources and, and looking at how do you create water sources because naturally they come have come from the rivers, you know, and if the rivers are beginning to dry up, what can we do um, to try and, and create that water again, not just for the wildlife? Yes, of course, that's critically important. And some of our projects for the first time in their history are, or some locations are, are what we call supplementary feeding because there's just not enough natural food around for the wildlife so we're having to to create supplementary feeding which of course that comes at a at a cost as well then yeah um and you know but 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 then back with the water sources you know if we can create water sources for the uh for the wildlife we need to look at the villages that surround the wild spaces and how can we also create you know more good sustainable water sources for the local people as well because again it's all about linking conservation and people together and and having the two live harmoniously and benefits you know side by side as opposed to this sort of unnatural if you like competition between wildlife and people and i always say if you're going to you've got to eliminate the competition between wildlife and people because unfortunately there'll only ever be one winner in it and it won't be the wildlife so we need to find a way to to allow the two to live harmoniously side by side and, and that doesn't mean everybody's sleeping next to a lion you know that means how do how do we all benefit from the same space right because if if you people living in that area so the elephants are dying from from dehydration it's not just them that are suffering it's also the local people so 
working yeah. together to find these solutions to ensure exactly. prosperity for both. Exactly. And, you know, you use elephants is, is a really good example. You know, if if the reserves and conservancies have, um, sorry, I thought I turned my phone on to silent. Um, oh, that's okay. Um, so if the if the reserves and conservancies, you know, the, the, the natural food sources is, are depleting, then what you'll find is, you know, the elephants are going to move out of the reserves and the protected areas, which in itself for them is not good. And then they'll do what we call crop raiding because they'll mm-hmm. go into crops. So now, now the elephants are destroying the livelihoods of the local people because they're relying on those crops to sell to, uh, you know, that's their livelihood. Right. So now the elephant becomes the enemy, you know, and now you're creating that competition. So how can we, again, always look to find solutions as to how we can live harmoniously side by side? Yeah, that's beautiful. And, uh, you know, I, when I heard of the the plan to do that at the Global Gala, I was, I had a sense of like, just, I, I don't know how to explain it. It just made me feel good to know that, that we're, there was the foresight there to plan ahead um, yeah. as our world is changing and climate's changing. And, you know, there's either heavy rains or there's drought. You know, yeah. it's hardly ever it's it's becoming more of the highs and the lows as as and as opposed to just being maintained in the middle somewhere now. So looking yeah. ahead is is what is needed to be done. Yeah, it's essential. I think, you know, we, mm-hmm. yeah, we have to we have to act now, but plan for the future. Right. Right. Exactly. Um I'd like to just discuss with you about, as we know that one of the biggest threats to rhino survival is poaching for their horn, because there is such a high black market demand for the horn traditionally in um, Asian medicine. And what I read was that one rhino horn can fetch in excess of 200,000 pounds or the equivalent of 215,000 US dollars. Can you uh, share with us why people want the horn and is there anything that can be done to help stop the demand at its source? Um, well, um, where do I start on that question? I'm sorry, um, that was a heavy question. It was a heavy um, question, but it's been on my mind. And Yeah, and, and it's a question that, that, that I get asked a lot as well. Um, so... Let me start with the the amounts the rhino horn can go for. Um, yeah, is about the amount you said. Probably not quite at that level now. So if we go back to the the real height of poaching, you know, in 2014, we were losing 1,200 rhinos plus in South Africa alone. Um, you know, I'm I'm glad to say it's not quite at that level now. Um, back in back in in that period of time rhino horn was selling on the black market for between and it's worth remembering that it's illegal to trade in rhino horn so you can't right. legally go and buy rhino horn anywhere um so sixty five thousand to a hundred thousand dollars per kilogram um is about what it was selling for now it's around about twenty five thousand dollars per kilogram which okay. which still is a huge amount of money so yeah. um you know for something that let's not forget is is made of keratin so it's essentially compressed hair and fingernails you know i've got pictures of rhino's horns broken off you know and you can see the strands of hair going through it so so you know so it's incredible that you know for, as i said something that's not a lot different to our hair and fingernails is selling for twenty five thousand dollars per kilogram um it's been used you know for like age old um in traditional asian medicine um you know there are you know there are definitely cultures and beliefs um within within asia that you know it can cure all sorts of illnesses you know at its height it was any believed anything from you know the common cold to cancer to hangovers you know um and and that drives drives the market uh and then what you found was the price started to go up the illegal wildlife trade generally which rhino horn is a big part of it as is elephant ivory and um pangolin scales and if people are if you're not familiar with pangolins then then um i would urge you to go and look on google at pangolins they're they're sort of prehistoric armored little animals but their scales are made of the same keratin that rhino horn is and they're actually the most trafficked animal in the world 
Um, so all of these different species, uh, so which the rhino makes a huge, the rhino horn makes up a huge part of it. The illegal wildlife trade is the fourth largest now illicit trade in the world behind any human trafficking, drugs trafficking, and arms trafficking. Isn't that amazing? Um, yeah. And, and the reason is, is that the risks traditionally have been less um, in the illegal wildlife trade getting caught than it would be in, in any of the others. So you, yeah. know, you find these these criminal gangs and syndicates that are moving into the illegal wildlife trade. And um, and then what we started to see was the, the the black market price of rhino horn going up and up and up. So it then, as, as happens, it then became a status symbol. Um, you know, so people... Um, and, and as the, the sort of the, 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 some of the Asian markets, you know, the likes of Vietnam, um, you know, their wealth, the, the, the world, country's wealth was increasing. Suddenly more people could afford these sort of prices. Again, you were pushing it up. I mean, there's all sorts of stories we hear of, you know, um, businessmen offering, offering you, you know, powdered rhino horn in your, in your glass of wine or, you know, as a, almost like a drug alternative. Um, and it often was there to, you know, to to show off how wealthy they were, because you know it was the most expensive commodity in the world. You know, more expensive than going buying platinum or gold or heroin or cocaine. Um, you know, so so people were using it as a status symbol to show, look how wealthy I am. I can afford to offer you rhino horn. I, I, I the analogy I often use is. You know, they didn't really want to offer you rhino horn. They wanted you to know that they could have rhino horn. A bit like if you own a Ferrari and you offer someone a lift, you probably don't really want to give them a lift in your Ferrari. You just want them to know you've got a Ferrari, right? So, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so there was the same sort of thing. So we have to over, overcome that. Now, the only positive, I guess, with um, with the status symbol is it, be, it became a real fashion item. And as with anything, fashions come and go. And I think that's why we've seen the the price drop to where it is has been for a number of years now around the twenty five thousand dollars per mark and and um um because you know we're not seeing quite that that level of you know appetite for it in that sort of socialite party world if you like um but it still has you know very strong um beliefs in in the asian medicine world and and you know we have to look at the fact that we're this, that's thousands of years of beliefs and we're not going to change that overnight sure. i think we do see that the next generation is um, is definitely thinking differently. I think you know we have to understand that you know Asian cultures think very differently, or have always felt very differently about animals and, and wildlife. Um, we are definitely seeing that change. Um, I think you know with with some of the, the newer generations. Um, and I think we just have to keep progressing on that. You know, with you know campaigns awareness campaigns and i think we will in time um you know we're seeing enough evidence that over time we will start to see a change but it's you know it's it's not a click your fingers change unfortunately oh uh, i wish it was but yeah i i always say actually you know I, I i actually think you could click your fingers and um and and sort it out in one go you know if you had if you had strong enforceable legislation both on the african side or the, you know where the the, the the sources and on the the buying side, so Vietnam, China. If you had really strong legislation and it was enforced, then you would stop it overnight. But the problem is, is you know we have to remember the countries we're working in. Unfortunately, there is a degree of corruption at senior government levels, um, and you know, and we have to, and and therefore, you know, we're not going to get that level of of cooperation. Unfortunately, that gives us that that legislation. Right. You know, but, but you know, if you made people afraid. The consequences of poaching was of getting caught was far greater than the benefits. You know, the minute the the, the benefits of doing what they're doing outweigh the risks of getting caught, and and in, until you reverse that, then you know you're not going to stop that completely. Exactly. When you um, have these campaigns to raise awareness, how do you <clears throat> spread this awareness to areas that you know, traditionally would use the rhino horn for yeah. curing ailments. So we we have um, we do we do a little bit um, in Vietnam, which is a country where where most of the the, the horn is trafficked through through to at least. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we don't as helping rhinos do a huge amount, and there's a and it's a very conscious decision for that. We do actually have one of our ambassadors actually is, is based in Vietnam, so we are looking at doing more 
um, through through him at the moment. And we've done some stuff with a, a local Vietnamese organization. But I, I genuinely don't, this is two sides to Rhino conservation is what I call protection and prevention. And protection is what we focused more on the projects I spoke about earlier. Prevention is the, the demand side and addressing, <laughs> addressing the demand. Um, you know, I get asked quite a lot, why don't I go and spend three weeks touring around China giving talks and educating people? And, you know, I genuinely, I, I don't think that's the right approach and I don't think it would is effective. And I say that because, you know, I'm from the UK. Um, I'm just another Westerner telling them how to live their lives when they would argue that their beliefs, I'm telling them their beliefs are wrong and they would tell me that they equally believe my beliefs are wrong. That's um, true. Exactly. So, yeah, I, that so, makes sense. Yeah, we have to respect. We have to whether you, if you don't always have to agree with the cultures, but you have to at least understand and respect the culture. So for me, a far more productive approach is working with local organisations. So you have local people talking to local people in in Asia and trying to influence the change that way, and and that's how we that's how we make those changes. So, um, you know, our coming back to where we started, our our resource levels. You know, we. We have, you know, we don't have, unfortunately, bottomless, bottomless money pit. So, you know, so we focus on where we think we can have the most impact on either the prevention or prevention side. And that's kind of where we have to allocate our resources. But uh, but that's not to say just because we're not as active in the prevention side as we are in the protective side, we don't think it's important. It's just that I think we need to influence more local people to be delivering those messages. Yes, yes, yes. I Yeah, I totally understand that that makes complete sense as cool. it, it wouldn't be appropriate for you to like you said to tour around and and yeah. give your two cents when you're not part of the culture and how could you understand you know yeah yeah and why, why should tradition. they believe me yeah, yeah exactly yeah i i understand that yeah <clears throat> can i ask about the debate about the trade of rhino horn can you Give any um, um, background on that? Yeah, definitely the most polarizing debate in in rhino conservation over the last ten to fifteen years. So there's a, a large number of people who believe that we should open up a legal trade in rhino horn and create, you know, bodies that are responsible for 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 moving the horn from from where it comes from in you know whether it's Africa or the Asian species into the destination markets and it's sold legally with licenses and permits um you know and on paper there's a good solid argument for that um i think the 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 reason i believe that's not the solution is that we don't no one really actually understands what size the demand would be if you opened it up that way um you your demand for you know, the, the the any legal trade would be in the white rhinos because they're they're easier to to take the horn off. And again, I should say the horn will grow back. You know, as does your hair and your fingernails when you cut it. You can cut the horn to a certain point; it will grow back. It has about a four year growth cycle. Um, so you, I believe, if you created an environment where you you put that through you know you're going to do that with white rhino because that's all we would be talking about i i would instantly fear for the future of like the black rhino in africa there's a far less of those there's about six and a half thousand black rhino left um mm. now and, and i fear that suddenly you know these syndicates are not going to roll over they're going to create environments that allows them to keep making the billions of dollars they are from 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 their you know illegal trade um, so I think suddenly the black rhino horn will become much more valuable than uh, and effective than the white rhino horn, because I, I can always guarantee it. Um, and also we don't have unlimited stocks of rhino horn. Like, you know, yes, you can cut rhino horns off, but, you know, as I said, there's a four year growth cycle. And OK, you probably would need to you could take them off every two years. Um, but. But you know, you start pushing that through, and now are you also are you now creating an environment where it becomes very easy to launder illegally or poached horn into the legal piece? You know, how do we manage that as well? Um, you know, we could sit there and say, well, actually, it'd be quite easy. You could do that, but then you have to remember as well, you know, the countries we're dealing with, and again, you know, unfortunately, there is levels of corruption. So, you know, have we really can we do have confidence? in the authoritative bodies that would have to manage this and in, in not being able to be bribed and you know and, and poaching coming through 
you know, and and anything just because you create a legal, uh, you know, a legal environment to move horns doesn't mean there's won't instantly stop being, you know, an illegal um, trafficking going on as well. Um, because you know, as I said, you would almost be looking at almost farming white rhinos, you know, where you could could have them in relatively smaller areas and take their horns off. Um, you know, I can guarantee that 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 um, that suddenly wild rhinos will will become you know more valuable their horn. And again, it's understanding the culture of the people buying it. You know, we we shouldn't be so naive to think it's just that they're buying rhino horn. No, they have a belief that it's not just a horn. That they believe that what the rhino eats gets into the horn, and it's a goodness from everything that they're eating. And you know, and the Earl of Af- Africa, and you know, it's so so that i think is is um we just need to understand all of that i don't think we do understand that well enough to be able to open up the can of worms and for me personally i believe that, that you would see extinction of rhinos much quicker if you did that you know what i will say is you could interview someone else who firmly believes that you know the trade in rhino horn would save the species and they would put an equally strong argument you know up around why that would be the art solution so um for me i'm looking at it i don't see enough science-based facts that tells me it's the solution and that's why i think you know we shouldn't be going down that road yeah it seems very unnatural to me yeah to put them through that I think so. There's two elements to it. I suppose you know. I, I agree with you. It's unnatural, but you know. So you do you have the you've got to you know the pro trade of pro trade side of the argument would argue you've got to take the emotional piece out of it and just look at it. I'm saving a species, um, which is why I come back to you, you know yes because you know I do what I do because you know I love rhinos and you know I don't want to see any rhino hurt and I would spend all right. day just in amongst rhinos if I could you know but. Um, <laughs> But you have to almost try and take that emotion out of it and just look at the bare facts and say, well, what do I think actually will happen if we do this? Um, but but it is the most polarizing debate. And, and unfortunately, you know, I've seen many different arguments. You know, there's no give in the middle, you know. Um, what I what I would say, and I've said to many people, and I do work with people who who believe that trading in rhino horn is is the solution. Um, you know, we will always just have to agree to disagree on that. But but what I would say is there are so many other elements to rhino conservation. And whether you think trade is good or bad, ultimately, both sides want to protect rhino and make sure the rhino has, have a future on our planet. Um, right. So if we if we try and come from that as a starting point and say, OK, well, we disagree on that. But there are so many different other things we can do that we agree on. So let's just focus on that. We shouldn't be fighting or warring amongst ourselves because we both want the same thing ultimately you know our, our enemy is not each other it's the poachers and the poaching syndicate so we need to remember that so yeah that's a great point your the, your starting base is coming from a same foundation of wanting to save the rhino so what is the best way to do that yeah um yeah that's key because that's mm-hmm. what you need to that's what you need to move forward and is what do you have in common exactly exactly yeah and you know and and as i said you know i work quite closely with people who have a different opinion but 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 we still work closely together on you know on other elements of protecting rhinos and protecting their habitat and that's that's great that speaks volumes of the work that you do yeah thank you by, by being able to continue that work with somebody who is thinking differently but you mm. remember that common common ground that you both have yeah uh that's fantastic that um <clears throat> you can have that perspective share that perspective and then move forward from that i did want to ask um <clears throat> another question about something spectacular that um helping rhinos did as restrictions as you mentioned were being lifted from covid there were increased poaching incidents and so at that time, there wasn't enough revenue generated income from tourism, and there wasn't enough funding for anti poaching units. What did, can you share with listeners what Helping Rhinos did to support um, the protection and conservation of rhinos during that time? Yeah, sure. So, we, um, as I mentioned, you know, at the start, you know, as, a, as an international not for profit organization, our role is fundraising and providing the funds 
that that's needed on the ground. And and typically the you know the project teams on the ground rely on their income from from organisation. Well, from from ecotourism. The biggest source of funding for conservation is ecotourism. People going on safari, spending the money. Every time you go into a you know a national park or a private reserve, you'll pay a conservation levy, and that's going to help that conservation work. Um, and then, you know, obviously what happened was that got switched off overnight um, when the COVID pandemic hit because no one could travel anywhere. So, you know, so they went through two years of hell with you know, that funding. And, you know, so what that then meant is that the reliance on not for profit funding became even greater. Um, you know, we couldn't obviously we couldn't re replace and replicate ecotourism funding as an entirety so we had to work closely on okay what can we do to you know what's the what what can we do to keep the essentials going to make sure we're keeping rhinos safe you know and that's what we were able to do was you know we started to you know we for all of our you know we talked about you know what's our vision for the future which you know we're able to look at now you know for for that period of time that was still there but it also got delayed by the best part of 18 months to two years because we now had to focus on can we keep range of um, anti-poaching patrol units on you know operational can we keep the eyes in the sky you know what does that look like you know we still had to feed the rhino orphans how are we going to feed our rhino orphans if if, if there's you know there's no money coming in from tourism so so i guess we had to step up and look for alternative revenue sources and that's kind of what we did we had to appeal to our supporters um you know to to really get behind us and and it was so encouraging i had people you know some people giving me a check and saying you know well you may as well have this because i can't go out because everyone was in lockdown so i can't spend any money the pubs and the restaurants are closed so you may as well have what i've got left at the end of the month because your need is greater than mine amazing uh, so so you know so i was really proud that we managed to actually increase our revenue during the two years of covid which was a great help to um to the organizations on the our, our teams on the ground um i have to say the flip side now is obviously we've come out of the pandemic and we've seen tourism return and and the teams on the ground are getting funding again from there but i think uh, while international fundraising organizations benefit to us to a certain degree during covid we are now really um we are really now we're going through our crisis i have to say this is in 10 years is our the toughest year um charitable giving generally is down you know there's a cost of living crisis we have the, exactly. the war in ukraine um cost you know, of living has gone up cost of living globally has gone up um you know the you know fuel prices gas prices electricity prices around the world are going up people are under a lot more pressure and you know the northern hemisphere we're going into into winter now as i said i'm in the uk i think the temperature hasn't got above freezing all day so people are having to to put their heating on you know and we are seeing um we are seeing an impact of that you know people cancelling their regular donations because they're looking at their own bank accounts and bills and charitable donations unfortunately are one of the first to go so um so we are we are sort of appealing to people you know around you know, around the way if, if they if you can help you know our rhino orphans still need feeding like i said not only do they need feeding we've gone from one to six yeah that's we, a lot we still we are seeing poaching on an increase so we still have to keep dogs on patrol we have to put the um fuel in the vehicles to allow the rangers to be on patrol we have to put the plane in the sky still otherwise we're going to end up you know, in a worse situation where we were six, seven years ago. So, um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's important now that, that, that we, you know, that we are able to show that we are operating, you know, with a, a big picture vision, but, but an immediate urgency into, into the need for, to maintaining funding. And, you know, and I, I get it. I really appreciate these difficult times, but you know, I think as you saw in the gala, that we did you know any any support that people around the world can give to us is is almost needed now more than it's ever been needed before because everyone is in is in such dire straits so um i fully understand you know not everyone can can help and support and you know people have to look after their families of course um but but if there i'm sure there are still people out there who has a little bit of extra that could help keep these majestic animals safe that would be fantastic. How can people find you so that they could make a donation? Where can they um, find you? 
Yeah, thanks, Nicole. The, the best um, the, the best way to do it is through the website. So um, our website is helpingrhinos.org. Um, and there's sort of links, there's donate buttons on there. There's a lot more information around the work that we do. Um, there's adoption programs that we're running so people can adopt one of our rhino orphans or one of the Northern Whites, Najin or Fatu, we spoke about. Um, also, just follow us on, on social media. Um, you know we're on we're all the all the main channels uh, facebook instagram twitter tiktok linkedin um and and i think just help spread the word um you know something like this podcast is great so you know even and and as i said i really do understand the times we're living in and understand not everybody can help financially but you know if you're listening to to the interview whether it's on the radio or on a podcast then then you know maybe share that with people help you know more the more people we can get the message out that you know rhinos and wildlife still need our help you know as much as and you know and it's critical for the, their future on the planet and our future on the planet um then there's even if it's not financial there's there's still a lot that people can do to help spread the word thank you so much simon the work that helping rhinos does is incredible tremendous and i am so honored that you uh, made the time to come on today to the podcast to talk about these beautiful creatures and how we can help yeah no thank you nicole I, it's been i really enjoyed it it's um yeah it, it, for me it's I, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity and you know the platform to talk to to your listeners and, and i i hope it was was interesting hopefully people maybe learned a thing or two and and you know they're always inspired to, to share the story and um, the, the story within their own sort of friends and family so thank you so much of course of course it was my pleasure thank you simon <laughs>